Um, yes, yeah, so as I was saying, the event cameras, they kind of were initiated in the late 90s and a different community doing chip designers, trying to put biology into chips to mimic the brain and try to do efficient sensing and then processing. Might be the webcam, but better than nothing. Uh, okay. I'll try to get close then to the webcam. Um, but nowadays, uh, the sensors are making their way to the robotics and computer vision community. As you can see in this plot, where we see the number of papers published in robotics and computer vision conferences and journals in the last six years or so. Okay, maybe I can make it smaller. And to put everyone on the same page, even though I thought it was maybe not too necessary because this is a grass plug and you have a lot of papers on event cameras, but this is the output of the event camera. And you can change the color if you want to visualize it in different ways. And the sta stationary scenario when the camera is not moving, we see background noise and then objects that are moving. And if I move the camera, then all the pixels in the sensor start firing, right? depending on mostly picking up on the edges. So it responds very well to motion in the scene but the signal this is an artificial image that we are creating the real signal is something like this in space time um, these are the events although the render is not working very well now it should show this this volume of data in space time all right um so this sensor for, in this case there's Camera, the Davis camera has both frames and events. I forgot to show. I can turn off the frames, and that's what you see. And I can color the events. Um, so these are what we see now two different representations. One, the frames is what is the um, sustained pathway, and the events are the transient pathway. And that's kind of what this camera is. These devices inspired these two pathways in the this two stream hypothesis that says that when the visual input comes to the back of the of the brain, then it splits into two. Uh, one is the what pathway, and the other one is the where pathway. The what is has these parvo cells most, mostly at the fovea and is in charge of details and it's slow, whereas the where pathway has magno cells all over the retina, it's in charge of motion. And because they, they are magno, they are big cells, they collect light very quickly and they are very fast. Um, yes, and these are the two outputs, which is so. So when we put uh, these sensors or all the sensors in robots, the biggest challenges in perception for to enable autonomy are robustness to difficult scenarios such as high speed, high dynamic range, and also that all the sensing and processing needs to be done on board the robots, right? They have limited capabilities. And event cameras are a revolutionary technology that has many advantages precisely in these type of scenarios, high speed, high dynamic range, low power. And well, we know from the research that comes out of this lab and other labs that they have lots of opportunities in, in drones, in automotive, um, Internet of Things. But as I show you, the data is different. There are no longer images, so it requires us to rethink computer vision. And the main, first question that comes to my mind when we have to rethink the way we do computer vision is how do we actually process the events to solve a given task? And this is a very broad question. It's not like a unique answer. It depends on the constraints of your system, depends on what you want to do and so on. Um, but I want to talk about this framework that uh, I've been working on the last years called contrast focus maximization. It goes also by other names like event alignment, motion compensation. It's a, it's, I think it's a nice framework to process the event data because it can be applied not just to one problem, but to many different problems in a unified way. And this is kind of like an, list of the problems and I will not go into all of them. Let me just present you at the beginning, what's the idea of this framework and then how we can apply it to two different problems, uh, stereo and optical flow estimation. And yes, so there's lots of people working on this framework. Uh, it's not only our lab in Berlin, but so we did it with images, but here at the uh, UPenn, Alex, Wu and Costas, they were also using at the beginning uh, point, point sets, I believe. Uh, this top right. 
and also in, uh, in Maryland, Cornelia, Camilla, and Yanis Alamonos, they're using time maps. So trying to do motion compensation with time-based representation of the events. And as I said, there are many others. The main idea is the following. This is the data that is collected by the camera over a few milliseconds, as you can see in the, in the axis, X, Y, and time. Each of these red and blue dots represent a brightness change. There was at this pixel, at this time, there was an intensity of brightness change, either positive, which is blue or negative, it's red. And assuming that the, these events were generated by moving edges, um, then the thing is that with this, if we just look at the data like this, we will not be able to see what were the edges that created these events. However, if we knew the motion and we just basically plotted this motion trajectories in, in, on the image plane and we counted, we just the only thing we do is we just count how many events happen along these motion trajectories and we generate an intermediate image, so-called image of work events. We will clearly see the edge structure that generated the events in some properties of this image. And the, the properties is that the edges that generated the events were assumed to be thin, so we want to get like a all sharp image. In more detail, it's as follows. This is your data, your input events. Then you make an hypothesis about what are the moving trajectories on the image plane of these uh, edges. And that's this W, it's a warp. Um, we displace the events, we warp the events to generate this intermediate representation in the middle called the image of warp events. And then we measure some property of this image of work events, uh, something that tells us how well the, the data, which is the input, and our motion hypothesis, the work W with parameters theta, how well they fit. And this goodness of fit is measured by some metrics, such as the variance of the image of work event. And this is what we say, this is a metric of event alignment. It tells us how well the events align along those motion trajectories. And this is just the objective function. Then we need a, an algorithm such as the steepest ascent or conjugate gradient that will take us to the top of the objective function. So this is the basic idea. And this is the intermediate images through the iteration of this optimization process. At the beginning, you can see that the edges, um, you can almost see how the camera was moved to generate these uh, events, because you can see that the, this edge of the monitor on the left is uh, quite thick compared to the one on the top. Um, so if you just count how many events happen at that pixel, you see the blurred uh, edge because it was moving and triggering events. But in reality, what you want is to count the events not per pixel, but in kind of skewed directions according to these motion trajectories to get an all sharp image. So what's the frame as we see right now? Then? This, what, is what the, like? this is the image of warp event in the middle through this iteration. I mean, on the bottom here, I'm, I'm doing like a 3D visualization, but the algorithm is not really doing a 3D visualization. It's this intermediate image, the image of warp event is just no, this no, but in the top, uh, it's not events, it's the gray value. Is the so we generate the image of warp events and in every pixel we count how many events the, the balance of polarities. Gray means that there was no event. Zero. White means that there were. The yeah, no sorry, black. sorry. Because you have a negative black and positive. So that's, that's right. Yes, and if we discard the polarity, we get something like if we discard the polarity and we plot it in negated form, so that black means. Uh, high count of events and white means low count of events, it's the bottom one. Anyway, here we can see the motion compensation. And let's look at some applications of these. Yes. Uh, I have a question about that. So in this, in this method, in theory, you can warp any edge, any edge, any uh, uh, regularization that uh, stops, like that, that avoids the previous motion or all the events. Okay, that's a good point. I guess here many people know about this. The question is if, if there's anything that prevents all the events to work into a single pixel or if you like, and that really depends on your space of motion hypothesis. Uh, if you only allow for rotational motion, this will not happen. If you allow for zoom in, zoom out, this will happen. 
Yes. Yeah. You have to say your data. You can you cannot change your data, but you can change or you can specify which motion you want to fit to the data. Yes, and the parameters of the motion are the data is the yeah it's a parametric work. Could be affine, could be a homography, could be more complicated. Okay, so for the task of 3D reconstruction, uh, first I need to introduce the monocular one to show you the stereo. I think it's easier. Um, so building this image of work event is very much related to array density. Uh, it's, it's clearly, I think, with this clearly shown with this example. Imagine that your scene consists of two points. The rest is, you know, two black points over a white background, and you have your camera moving in this world, and uh, you know the camera will see these two points and will generate some events. And when you receive one event in the camera, and the evidence that it tells you is that along the cone, the line of sight or the cone of sight of, of that pixel where the event happened at that time, um, there is some three D structure. And if you do that for all the other events, and you try to back project of these events into these rays because the camera moves continuously and pro produces these events uh, with in synchronous time right like um, almost continuously you have a, a situation like this that if you back project the events from many different positions you will get this so-called ray density and the points of high ray density are telling you the candidate locations for the location of the 3d points I mean, there are many serious intersections, but the ones with the highest ones are kind of like, seems like good ones. Um, okay, so this ray density is also called in computer vision disparity space image when you're trying to do uh, multi view stereo. Let's try to see what it looks like for this example. It's a sequence with a one dimensional motion. You see different objects in uh, the back and in the front. Well, if we back project these rays as it's here depicted on the left, um, and we count them, and we count them on this kind of projective DSI, but if I visualize this 3D structure, uh, which is just counting on every voxel, we are counting how many rays pass through each uh, of them, then we get this volume on the right. So the size of this volume is the X pixels, the Y pixels, and then the Z, it's just the number of deaf planes that we uh, kind of um, sample in space. And we see that the regions of that are light blue, they correspond to the regions of many events where back projected to those places. And they look like the regions where they are, there is three structure. You know, the darts are in the back, and the arc of triumph is here in the front. And uh, these, the relationship with the contrast maximization or focus maximization or event alignment can be seen here on the left. As we sweep through these planes from the front to the back, um, we see that uh, some points come into focus uh, and then some, so they come out of focus, in focus and out of focus again. You can see here, this is in focus, then this object and towards the end, the darts become into focus. And this coming into focus means that there is like a high number of events accumulating there, right? projected and accumulating there. So this is, these points have a high contrast. And so it's a contrast, the name comes from visual contrast. And contrast is related to sharpness. So if for every point on this uh, reference, uh, despite this space image, every pixel, we have like a hundred of these death planes and you look for what is the death plane that has the highest number of event counts and you threshold that and you get the depth map on the right that you can back project into a point cloud. Okay, so that's the monocular case. Um, and we use it in, in this system called EDO, uh, where we show how we build the, um, the disparity space image are not shown here, but it's just the final point cloud as you can see on the top left. The famous carpet. Yeah, the famous carpet to generate lots of texture. Yes. If you don't have contrast, then you don't have events. Okay, so that's the idea for the monocular one. Interesting thing is that the monocular case, uh, it's difficult to establish event correspondences, and this algorithm completely avoids it, and it's very efficient. 
like that. And then we said, can we move this to stereo? And the interesting idea is that most of the stereo methods, 99% of the stereo methods that you are using event cameras, um, use the fact that the assumption that of what is called event simultaneity or coincidence detection, that when an object is triggering events in one camera, if you look at the other camera along the same epipolar line and in a very close by time interval, there will be an event or that correspond to the other one. And then if you match these two events, then you can back project and get a 3D point. Right. So this is the, I would say most um, stereo-based method that use spike uh, input work like this. And it's already in the, in the thesis of Misha Mahmoud, um, 1990 or so. The problem with this is, I mean, it's, it works good for dynamic scenes and it's fast. The problem is that for, if you want to use it for SLAM, we need more baseline because it's not accurate enough. You know, if you want to do it to recover a map of a room, you need uh, more accurate depth estimates. So you just don't do it for a very short uh, time interval. You need to geometrically, you need to move and create a more parallax for that. So if that is our goal, trying to use event cameras to do uh, depth estimation, stereo depth estimation for SLAM, Right. Then we cannot follow that approach. Uh, and if we want, so let's not try to build on coincidence detection. And we've seen that the monocular method works quite well without that assumption, because with one camera, you cannot do coincidence detection. Um, how can we extend the monocular one to the stereo case? And one way to extend it is that, okay, you have the events from the left camera. You have the events from the right camera. You process one instance of the monocular algorithm for each of them, and you get a point cloud for each of them, and then you fuse the point clouds. The problem with this is that it generates duplicates points, and you have to cross-process the point cloud to try to remove noise and so on. There is this thresholding operation where you are converting the DSI into the depth map, and it's, it's not so nice. Instead, what we propose is to do an early fusion and um, back project the events from both cameras to a common region in space. So we, we define a disparity space image region. And in this region, you count how many events come from the left camera and how many events come from the right camera at every point in the space. And then we fuse them. We fuse the two DSIs into a single one. Uh, and then now we only have one DSI, we can do the monocular case. Um, the idea is then how, how to fuse them. Uh, but let's show with an example. So these are the events from the left and right cameras. Then we back project them into space, generate the DSIs that are shown on the left and fuse them to generate the DSI on the right. Here is with something called the, the harmonic mean, like a per voxel harmonic mean. And you can see that if we sweep along depth or around the side or the top view, the this, uh, Ray density comes into focus really at the correct locations, and we can extract the depth map and the confidence map, which is just the number of, of events. Um, for a one dimensional example, this maybe becomes a bit more clear. The camera is moving sideways, looking at the scene that is front to parallel. And if we sweep the planes from back to front, or front to back, sorry, then we see that the, the events come into focus at the correct depth, and the scene is. The, the, Point cloud recovered is also quite uh, flat, quite planar. So let's compare the monocular and the stereo case um, to try to answer this question, how do you merge the rates and densities? That's kind of like a question. Um, let's see the evolution of the disparity space image uh, as we increase the amount of data. So I will show these three projections. This top left is the front view. Uh, this is the top view and the uh, the right plot is the side view of this volume. And when we have 50 milliseconds of data for a single camera, this is what it looks like. You can see kind of the edge pattern on the front view, and you can see the, the rays that have been you know, back projected uh, from the camera viewpoint and also the side view. And the stereo case is already very different because imagine that we are fusion fusing this with something called the harmonic mean. It's, it's kind of different, the structure, 
um, not so much in the front views, but in the top view and in the side view. And that's because we have two sets of rays. We have the same as before, the set of rays coming from the left camera, but we also have the set of rays that come from the right camera. Uh, you can see it also here in the shape. And they are curved because we are not using depth, we are using inverse depth parametrization of the disparity space image. Um, what we see is that as we increase the amount of data, so the camera is moving, collecting more events, and these events are being back projected into this parity space image, and the rays now start to intersect in the monocular one and become more localized. This is the top view. And in the stereo, you see that they are much more localized because you only have not the rays from the left camera, but also from the right camera. And they are being fused in an in, kind of like an intelligent way that um, the harmonic mean as I've been showing a minute. And also in the side view, you can see that the, the structure of the plane is, is uh, appearing much faster than in the monocular one. Of course, if you have enough data, then the structure will appear. But um, one of the advantages of the stereo is that you can do 3D reconstruction faster than with the monocular one. And if yesterday we saw the platonic solids, today we see the Pythagorean means. Uh, the way we fuse the data is by using somehow pointwise operations between the two voxels. And we tried different ones, but we kind of converge into these generalized means that go between the minimum and the maximum. We have the harmonic mean, geometric mean, and arithmetic mean. And if we plot them, uh, fixing one of them, for example, we fix one of the arguments to one, uh, you can see the different shapes of them. And then we compare them visually, uh, trying to fuse them. And we, for one scene, we, we get this kind of results. The first row are the depth maps. The second row is a zoom version of the depth maps. And the bottom row are the confidence maps, which is the count of events. Um, the arithmetic mean is the same operation as we just count the number of events that come from the left and the right, and we don't care where they come from, right? The arithmetic mean is just the, the average. It's just a sum. Um, geometric mean, it's uh, the square root of the product. It, it matters then if, if one argument is big or the other one is small. Um, the harmonic mean, it matters even more because it's dominated by the smallest of the arguments. So the harmonic mean and the minimum, what they are trying to say is that they will only be high, there will only be a high value for the minimum or the harmonic mean, better harmonic mean, if both are large. If one of them is, um, so there, what's the sound? Oh, sorry, maybe was. If, um, so they are implementing kind of like an AND operation. They, and you can see that the harmonic mean is doing a better job at removing outliers than the geometric mean or the harmonic mean. These objects here are outliers. So we go for the harmonic mean because it's also uh, differentiable and has nice properties. Um, we compare with the state of the art and compared with the generalized time-based stereo from Paris, uh, semi-global matching uh, adapted to events, um, transactions and robotics 2021, I guess, ESVO. Um, our method, we can see that qualitatively the results look good. They look uh, like thin edges, thin structures, points, uh, in many locations of the locations of the image plane. I mean, I have a data tables for that in the paper that I thought. So, okay. I didn't understand why did you, you couldn't apply any like semi-global or global class instead of applying just local. You, you found local max, right? Yes. We do a per pixel operation. Right? For, for every pixel, we, we try to find what is the point that has the largest focus. I mean, you could try to fit a surface, but the depth map is going to be semi-dense. So fitting a surface, we think it doesn't make too much sense. So we do a Pixel-wise, so you look at the depth values. The, you know, you look at the focus or the contrast for every the value, and then select the maximum one. Okay. 
in a long wave span. Yes. But we can do it also for short of not a long wave, not, not a long fix. Okay, yeah, we could try or talk about it later. So these are qualitative results. The quantitative ones are on this paper and advanced intelligence systems. Um, I thought I would show results on MVSEC. So the data set from here, from the GRASS platform, Costas Group. Uh, top left are the events, ground truths in the top. Um, we are comparing against the monocular one on the bottom left, uh, ESBO, uh, transactions and robotics here. And the last column is our method. You see we provide more um, semi-dense step maps than ESBO. We are also able to reconstruct even in regions where um, there is no ground truth uh, like the LIDAR. because it's kind of like a modern based method. It's not supervised or semi-supervised by another signal. Um, yeah, this is kind of like this motion forward and backward. They are not sp specifically good for 3D reconstruction. It's better to do a sideways motion. Still, we're able to get um, dense reconstruction. And compared to the monocular one, we get um, more rid of the outliers. The LIDAR and the camera motion. Yes. Here, this is the results on the VGA resolution um, data set DSEC from the University of Zurich. DSEC. The ground truth comes from the LIDAR. And as well, we are able to reconstruct even when the LIDAR doesn't provide the ground truth. More coverage than, more completion than ESBO. And here we are more accurate than the monocular one. And we are also able to remove outliers from that are present in the monocular one. So the main advantages of the stereo are trying to get rid of outliers because of the consistency between left and right rays and faster speed of convergence and accuracy. This is- uh, I have a comment there. Yes. The previous one. I mean, we talked indeed uh, also ourselves about outliers in stereo, but in situations like this, like of driving, actually precision is more important than recall. So, which means that we might have missed a lot of stuff in the white areas. Maybe. Which are close. So it's not uh, that, that they are more important than the outliers. Okay. I mean, outliers, like the false alarm, I mean, okay, this is functional, but uh, if you miss a pedestrian. Uh, yeah, maybe. In this case, we kind of set the parameters to show, I mean, we, the advantages so in terms of outliers i mean we have some completion and some precision and recall curves and it was difficult to argue about them um but this is just one example to show that the outliers uh, are removed better with the stereo i mean in the white areas here there is yeah the wall of the building maybe we miss some of reconstruction um, the problem also is driving data sets like this is that the apparent motion in the center of the image is smaller. And then you can see that when you're driving straight, the number of events that happen in the middle of the image are not too many. These are results on the one megapixel um, data set from TU Munich. And here the camera is moving a room in circles. The poses are coming from a motion capture system. And then outside, the poses are coming from a vision inertia bolometry system. Again, this is a difficult situation. Forward motion is not great for 3D reconstruction, especially also with event cameras, but we still were able to get decent depth maps. Um, they get better when we go outdoors. Um, so this is somebody with a helmet hiking outside. Um, and the other characters, no meter, centimeter. Well, we don't have ground truth for this one. Uh, but for with the um, driving sequences. Ah, uh, yes, I'll have to look at the numbers. But okay. They are much bigger than MB6, yes. Uh, this is the question of the Because I know the camera. Well, you can just need to ask for it. Okay. 
So it's like, I think you can integrate the IMU for a very short amount of time. You can get the IMU and uh, integrate them. Yeah, was so. Yeah, maybe they are not available, but if, if you ask and or if you get the IMU and integrate for a very short amount of time, 200 milliseconds, or it's enough to provide process. Good thing about this method is that because we are not doing pairwise matching, we do everything fusing into a single DSI. We can fuse more than one, two cameras. We can fuse three cameras and it scales linearly. And we did this with a data set from the University of Maryland. So to conclude this part of stereo, um, Establishing event correspondences is not needed in stereo reconstruction for SLAM. We know it was not needed in monocular. We know it's not needed now for stereo. Even more, this coincidence detection is not needed at all. Um, I didn't show the results, but if you fuse the aside from difference of interval, you still very nice get very nice results. Uh, this produces state of the art results. Uh, improves stereo mainly improves the speed of convergence, the outlier and removal. And the and the accuracy, and it works well. So works well across multiple resolution. I showed results on the MVSEC data set that is kind of three forty six columns, uh, DSEC which has six hundred and forty, and the one megapixel from TU Munich, uh, and this case linearly with the number of cameras, which is also quite a nice property. We have a multi camera setup, and the code is available. We are just waiting for the license to to release it. So that was a part on stereo. And if we have time, we could maybe go through the optical for part. Or you have a question? Uh, yeah. For the monocular one, it's real time. For the stereo, I mean, depends how you put it in the computer. You can also adjust the number of depth planes that you want to use. If you use 50 or fewer depth planes, it might be better to change the data. It also depends how many events come. I mean, with the VGA resolution, it's difficult with one megapixel. It's also proportional to the number of events. To apply the poles of this visual camera. So there are tricks to do that. You can do the, I think if you don't have the pose, if it's continuous time, you could do like linear interpolation. You can also put them in small batches to make the interpolation faster. Yes. I mean, this batching the events, like every 300, 1000 events have the same pose, speeds up a lot. But then you make the approximation that you know, these 300 events have the same pose, which may not be true. Yeah, we have the numbers in the, in the paper. We check them later. Look at the driving sequences. You know, Yes, we do like this every yeah, chance. Every DSI takes maybe for the videos, we probably show them at 20 or 50 hertz. There's a question. Could you please comment on how compute resources are needed? Does this run in real time? Okay, yes, the monocular asset. So in EDO, you can download the code, yes. I mean, there are always parameters that you can tune, and it depends on the amount of events that you have. So back then, when we were using the Davis 240, you know, uh, it was real time. Maybe today, with the VGA resolution with 200 million events per second, it's not real time. And, but, but maybe you need to sample the number of events or do something about it. Following up on the question, compared to other correspondence methods, what is the end-to-end -end latency of this method considering that you have to do focus maximization? This is important for real-time operation mobile robots. Yes, so the focus maximization here is just, there is no, the algorithm is simple. It's just, uh, yes, per pixel, you look for the value out of the 50 or 100 depth planes that you are sampling, you look for the value that has the maximum one. Um, yeah, again, maybe the numbers are in the paper. We could check them later. Should I try to speak about optical flow? Yes. Yeah. Okay, optical flow, it's uh, another application. And let's try to go through it in increasing number of degrees of freedom. So imagine that we have only the events from this patch. And 
you know, this is from a data set. And if, if we assume that all the events in this patch have just one two dimensional vector to say how the camera was moving there, how the patch is moving, then I can actually plot the landscape. I can plot the contrast, I can plot the focus against uh, the horizontal axis, which is the velocity in the X direction and the vertical axis, the velocity in the Y direction. So I can try several points in this domain and I can say what happens when I work the events according to uh, this point, this velocity, which is working them as if they had moved upwards. Well, it turns out that um, we don't see an edge structure there, so it's blurred. If we work according to another point, so this blue arrow on the left, which is this point, uh, we start to see this structure of some edges, but it's really the one that won the um, point number two, which is the velocity that best fits with the data, right? So the green vector here fits the best in terms of event alignment with the data. So this is in two dimensions. It's worked well with images and similar method was used here by Alex and Costas and their feature tracker and also implemented in their visual inertial odometry. Uh, you just try to track patches of this and then you fuse them uh, and do an ego motion estimation. Well, uh, the difference to ours is that we have an EM step for which events are true. Yes, I think the difference is that you were using um, points instead of images, right? So you were comparing pairwise. And then when you use events as points and you have to do the pairwise comparison to reduce, uh, when well, you need something that tells you which event goes with which other event to do this data association. And then you use the expectation maximization algorithm. Um, here, when you work the events, and then every pixel of the image of work events, you count how many of those happen. Every event is implicitly voting for that pixel and the neighboring ones. So it is kind of like an implicit data association. The complexity is no longer quadratic. You don't need to compare every event with every other event. The complexity is linear in the number of events. But I think the idea is more or less the same. It's just track every patch and then gives you a location of the feature and then, yeah. Okay, so this is sparse flow, uh, but uh, I want to talk about dense flow. And in dense flow, we would like to get something like it's here on the top bottom right. This is dense flow mask with the events and we want to get an all sharp image like it's shown on the top right. Please explain to the audience the color coding. Uh, sure, the color coding is, um, so we are representing optical flow, which is a velocity vector. And the color represents the angle uh, in which this vector uh, for every pixel. And the, the saturation, this is the amount, how big the, the optical flow vector, the displacement is. Black with its small and it's saturated color when it's uh, the largest. So in every pixel, if we play it again, we have a color and the color represents kind of like the motion, um, apparent motion on the on the retina. Okay. And there has been previous work on this, like Alex was working on this here, Costas too, and uh, people at TU Delft too, trying to apply uh, converting events into some voxel width representation and then apply some deep neural network architectures such as FlowNet, which, um, which was before was self-supervised, but now you convert it into unsupervised way with a with different loss. The problem is that it's unstable to train and it suffers from problems like event collapse or vanish of the, of the events. And this is an example of the event collapse. This is the question that was asked before I thought, right? The network learns quickly that if it wants to maximize the contrast or the focus, it will push all the events into uh, single locations. These, yeah, these accumulations of events increase the contrast. Or the network can learn that to maximize the contrast, it can push the events away from the image plane and then they will not be counted. And you know, it's also like if you don't normalize, or, and this is also uh, not a solution that you're searching for. Uh, so this overfitting issue in contrast maximization, which I guess 
we identified here depends on the type of warp. Some warps don't allow it, some warps do allow it. And the choice of the objective function. And we have this paper, where a recent paper this year, that we show that it works even with one degree of freedom. So if you do optical flow, which you allow a much more complex motion, it's, it's even, it gets even worse. Um, and this one degree of freedom, imagine these events from the MVSEC data set driving in here in Philadelphia. And you collect data and you um, work the events according to zoom in, zoom out motion. So this is the approximation where you have just translational motion of, of the car in the set direction. So the optical axis of the camera. Um, and for this set of events, you measure some objective, some contrast. So how sharp this image is um, without velocity, right? This is just the original events. And then you allow this to move in this parameter space that is basically just the speed of the car more or less. Um, and if you maximize, um, try to maximize the contrast, you will get that this is the, actually a solution that gives you maximum one before the events jump to the other side of the, of the focus of expansion. And it's not really the solution that you want uh, because yes, this has maybe higher image variance uh, or any other objective, but it's really the solution that you want is this local maximum. So then it comes the question that Claude was asking, do you have regularization? Do you do something about it? Yes, so in this paper, we try to address this and show how it can be regularized with divergence and with um, area measurements, how the events deform. So overfitting leads to regular flows. Uh, the problem is that there are too many degrees of freedom, ideally two one vector per pixel, so two degrees of freedom per pixel of the image plane, and the loss is too strong. It can make this, push these events to collapse. Um, so any suggestions, how could we address these issues? Spatial smoothness. Spatial smoothness is one, yes, to reduce the number of degrees of freedom. So instead of having one flow per vector, uh, sorry, one vector flow per pixel, we could have one vector per patch or tile, and then interpolating between them, some linear interpolation. Any other thing? Can make the assumptions about that. Make the assumption about that, but then you need somebody to provide you with the depth, right? Well, if you have uniform depth, then it becomes an eight degree of freedom problem. It's a homography. It's much simpler, yes. Um, so we could do the regularization that Claude was saying before and to use, for example, the total variation, but we also need, this is not enough. We need to rethink the data fidelity term. I will show it in a minute. And that's just the objective. Then you need like a good way to get to that uh, local maximum or minimum. So you need better like course to find approach. So the first trick or the first fix of this would be to change the data fidelity term. Imagine that we have an edge that is moving from left to right and it triggers these blue events. And we propose to warp these events and according to these orange arrows. And if we do so, uh, and we warp the events to time T1, then we will have this kind of peak. All the events are accumulating here, um, which is okay. I guess we are motion compensating the edge. The problem is that if we work to a different time, we observe that this, we don't have any more sharp edge. We have like a blurred thing. We have a histogram where these, these five events have been spread out over the pixels. So instead, if we encourage the, the flow to be, you know, to provide sharp images of warp events, or high contrast, not just at one reference time, but at multiple reference times, it will be a better flow, as you can see on the, on the right. This flow, it's more uniform. It's um, it kind of keeps sharp at T1 and at the last on the, the time of the last event. This is an example from the MVSEC dataset um, where we work to the first the time of the first event. And yes, this is sharp, but the other ones get blurred. And you see the flow is quite irregular. Instead, if you 
work the events and ask the events to be sharp at all three times, the first time, the middle time, and the last time. These are the three images of warp events. The flow is much more regularized, it's more uniform. So that's kind of the trick. We are asking the, the flow field that we want to estimate to generate sharp images of warp events, not just at one time, uh, but at any reference time. Um, and you can see here how the, chain, the field is changing. I guess Alex also had working at two times that the idea was somehow different. He was working because he wanted to uh, attack a problem of the back propagation of the gradients of the neural network. So we found out that you know if you ask this working to happen at two or three places, it's it's given this um, added mitigation of the overfitting, so more regularization. So that's the first trick to change the focus. The second trick or secret, as we want to call it, is the, to change the flow parametrization. And this has a smaller effect than the previous one, but we saw that events are space time and using a 2D optical flow model is maybe not the best one. So when we have one vector field per pixel, it's good for images when you have two images and then you can say every pixel how it's moving, but in events we have really like a volume. So if you had two, two events happening at the same pixel, they were most likely triggered by two different edges. Why should we work them with the same velocity? Uh, so it's better to have something like a space-time flow. Any suggestions? How could we do it? I mean, we have the events in a volume, right? And we are working them and we say it would be better to have also a volume of flow field that it's a volume and we can work the events. Speed is continuous. The speed is continuous. Well, it's also continuous in the top. Can you keep more smooth, smoother? Okay. Take the frequency of the effect of the other Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So we could, if we had additional information, we had there for objects, we could say that we could use that information. Let's try to work it out with a one dimensional example. We are moving again before we have the tower and the darts and the tower is moving in on top of the darts. I hope you can see it. So here we have the two images at the beginning of the first event and the last event, the time of the last event. And this dark, very black dots represents the, the darts, and this gray dots represents the events generated by the tower. And you see they are moving, they are kind of events generated by two objects that move at different speeds. And, uh, and these two events, they are from different objects moving at different speeds, but we are working then with the pixel that is defined, with the velocity that is defined at the pixel, the same pixel. Um, so it doesn't produce a sharp image of warp event. It would be better to try to warp them. If you know depth, you could use it. If you know which events go with which objects, you could also use that, but it's more expensive. A simple fix would be to request that the flow that we estimate is constant along the streamlines. So not constant along the, in the pixel space, but here these three pixels have one velocity and the other four pixels have a different velocity, but really that you define it's somewhere and then you compute these streamlines, which is a bit more expensive, but this works well to deal with occlusions, right? So in, the, in this example, the, this is blurred and here it becomes sharper. It becomes even more sharper when, when the speed between the background and the foreground are uh, much more apart because the speeds are low. Streamlines are computed by writing the partial differential equation which is you know, constant, the total derivative of the flow should be zero and solving it. So you define the flow at one reference time and then you expand it to the whole volume by solving the partial differential equation. These are things that I learned from Tony Yetzi, <laughs> how to do PDE solving. And here is the flow, how it's kind of self-propagating itself. You cannot this is the total derivative uh, of the flow with respect to uh, time. Yes, yes, it's the same equation as 
brightness okay. constant C. Yeah. If but you instead of intensity, you put all the components of the flow. Yes, instead of intensity, yes. Mm -hmm. So that's the second secret or trick, time awareness. And the third one is multi-scale. There's not much novelty but, here. Uh, does it mean that you compute the acceleration as well, or? No. We solve it with, um, with, um, how do you call it? This um, solvers, the Burgers equation. It's the same discretization as Burgers equation. Okay, and the third one is um, course to find to try to get better to the solution. Um, and the first, what we do is that we compute a single flow vector for the whole image, and then we divide this grid to compute four vectors. And as we compute and refine this contrast, what we see is that the image becomes sharper and sharper. So we have a course to find approach to obtain the solution, which also improves. The question is how many levels, then it, you can do a sensitivity analysis and find that with single scale is not good enough. The flow is quite irregular, as you can see in this column. Uh, but uh, as you add more uh, scales, like five scales is good enough. If you go beyond that, then you have the problem of too many degrees of freedom. So the collapse. And these are results on the MBSEC data set. Uh, so the middle column is the ground truth flow from the LIDAR and the camera motion. The right column is our algorithm, same colors as before. So the color represents the flow and the top row. And in the bottom row, we have the warp events. You can see that they are sharp even when in locations where there is no ground truth available. So the problems with those ground truth locations when there is no flow is that if you use them to train the neural network, you don't have a signal there, right? Um, so here we are comparing against BB Flownet from, I guess, uh, Alex and Costas and against TU Delft. These are still result on the MVSEC data set from uh, this lab, the grass lab, the grass lab. Um, and we show that, yes, but even when there is no ground truth in the LIDAR, you can get sharp images of world events. And it's a model based method. And it works also at the higher resolutions, the VGA. Uh, this is the DSEC data set. And we compare against ERAFT, which is the supervised network from the University of Zurich. The problem is that it's trained on, on data that doesn't have independent moving objects. So it doesn't work well with such things, but our method works well on, on the background and also with the independently moving objects. And this is a uh, paper that we are presenting at ECCB this year. The code is available or will be available. And the interesting is that all the things that I showed you are ideas that are model based, but they can be transferred to deep neural networks. So, what we did is we took the clone it and we train it with the loss function that we presented before. And it gives uh, quite good results. So the conclusion of this part is that, yes, there are prior works on dense optical flow, but I think we need to take a bit more a deeper look into the data, not just uh, try to apply image-based method to event data. It's, it's really important to try to understand better what the data is. Um, and we showed some um, principal ways to try to apply contrast maximization to this problem. The method achieves a state of the art results in the benchmark, so the MPSEC benchmark and the DSEC benchmark, which are the ones available now. And it can overcome the limitations of you know, lacking ground truth data if you want to use it later for training. And it's transferable to unsupervised learning settings. We can train it with it with this loss function and time awareness. Um, just to wrap up, these are the research page at my lab. Uh, I also have slides and videos from a course that I teach at TU Berlin on event-based road vision. This is a link to the paper that I, I wrote together with uh, Costas and other colleagues in the field. And we also have this list of event-based vision resources where we try to put uh, the papers, code, data sets, workshops, all type of links so that people can access, uh, look for the information faster than just searching for it in on the website.
on, on, the, on the internet. Um, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Well, I, I, I think there is also work from Imperial College where they do it and they have a nice real time demo. I can, when I, if I switch to the Linux uh, partition of my computer, I can try to run the, the rotation of demo in real time. It will work with the Davis 346. If we put more events, maybe not. Um, for the optical flow, it took, I think, around nine seconds because we are processing millions or several million events uh, from the VSEC data set. But if you run it, if you use the model-based method, so the, the, this multi-focus loss function and you train a neural network, then it's as, as fast as the other ones, right? So here, this table shows the results and they are all as fast at inference time as EB Flownet. It's just another EB Flownet that was trained in a different way. And I think this takes like seven milliseconds or so. It takes more time to convert the events into voxels, but then the inference time is very short. So what is the minimum uh, uh, like time interval that this should work? Because uh, if you accept the big integration on the partial regression operation, it would probably need a considerable time extent. Um, so we didn't explore how long should it be. We know that for contrast maximization to work well, there was a paper from uh, Timo and co colleagues in Australia that they showed more or less that the edge should move by two or three pixels. Uh, so that's kind of like a rough number. If, if you have, if you, if your time span is shorter the fact that the, the edge has not moved by two pixels trying to maximize the contrast and we just not move it. Um, here we are really using the benchmarks and the benchmark says that for for MVSEC there are two evaluations intervals one is dt equal one time between two one, two frames so I guess this is 22 milliseconds and dt equal four is the time between four frames and this is 89 milliseconds and the, Sure, but I guess we use them. Just the time there. Yes, uh, but why? Uh, the yes, that kind of was happening with the work to Delft, but we saw that it it didn't give us good results, right? I think people from to Delft were using it here on the right. They were using just the last ones. Um, I mean, anyway, my motivation for this is that you can not uh, be the reactive behavior based on a, on a big processing volume. Yeah, uh, definitely. And uh, also, uh, would it, there be any way to do it at the sliding window, even if the window is there, to add events and subtract events and reevaluate the method? I guess so. Yes, the people at Imperial, they are doing this kind of. I mean, I also at the beginning use this like in window, but they they have like another approach that they are doing the same, adding and subtracting, adding the events that come, subtracting the ones that use the paper. The sliding window is already in the 2017 paper, and the other one from Imperial, it's a public paper recently was ECCP also before from uh, from Yanis the Nidis. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the times we, we had to use really the times of the benchmarks. We used, uh, if you want to sell this paper in a computer vision community, you need to compare to many other ones. And these are the, like an out of benchmark and you have to compare to this. So 22 milliseconds, 89 or 100 milliseconds, which is for the DSEC data set. But you get like millions of events in 100 milliseconds and it's not so much optical flow. I mean, 100 milliseconds, 
the trajectories of the of the points are no longer straight and no longer can be curved. Well, the PAT is equal to four, but the J is equal to four. So I think Yes, I think Shintaro, the PhD student, uh, was in contact with Alex and he was asking how was evaluation done to, to make it really good, comprehensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so okay. optical flow is instantaneous. Right? It's really yes. So, how much of the like of it, it's uh, the last how much of it does it of the Curve, which is better, right? So it's not really, it doesn't change enough. It just makes it better. Well, they're going to change, right? Because they're, it's not the same to measure. I mean, yeah, one is the method, one is the tangent, and the other one is kind of like the method of, uh, of lines. Or, uh, I mean, I even if you look at it as a displacement, which obviously would be bigger, it just uh, it can be looked up to the tangent even at a higher speed. Yes, the thing is that we see differences with them. So dt equal one, actually the motion is very, very small. There is not much to see in these sequences. It's only in dt equal, equal four that you see more of the displacement. I mean, dt equal one, you could almost predict that it's not moving. Right? Would be already a good prediction. All right. Thank you very much, Yarmo. Thank you. Thank you.